when many of us think about the Reformation, the first figure we think about is, is Martin Luther. But from the perspective of the Bible, there's actually a more, almost a more important figure uh, before that, uh, who's maybe a little bit less well known outside of the, the halls of, of academia, and that's Erasmus, yeah. whom you mentioned in the last session, who produces in 1516 a sort of radically new New Testament. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, what makes, what makes a New Testament new? Uh, what, did, what did Erasmus do that was, that, that, that was revolutionary? Yeah, and it truly was revolutionary. And, and you find in 2016, there are many people who are, you know, uh, celebrating the anniversary of this particular Bible because it did something extraordinary. And Erasmus changed the game, I think you could say, you know, quite accurately. In 1516, Erasmus printed a work that he'd been preparing for some time. It was a New Testament. And the, on, with that New Testament, he had the Greek text on one side and the Latin on the other. Now, this is something remarkable for a variety of reasons. First of all, Greek was not a language that many people had access to, particularly in Northern Europe. It had uh, appeared during the course of the 15th century, but in Northern Europe, Erasmus is in Basel, uh, it, it become, it's quite extraordinary to have somebody who knows this language. But what he's done is he's put the Greek alongside the Latin of the Vulgate. Now he's tidied up that Latin according to the Greek text. But what was that Greek text? Erasmus had used a series of manuscripts to prepare that Greek text. Now that might seem an obvious thing for us to do and think about uh, biblical scholarship in those terms. But it was something quite new. The, uh, this idea that you went to manuscripts to prepare what he saw to be the best possible version of the Greek. Now, he didn't use a large number of manuscripts and that uh, practice would evolve during the 16th century as more manuscripts became available. He only used a, a handful, but nevertheless, the principle was established. And in, with this Bible, he put the two languages in conversation with one another. He put the Latin of the medieval Bible against the Greek text, the original, or what was believed to be the original text. And of course, that exposed a whole variety of problems in the Latin. We know, as we've already mentioned, that medieval uh, scholars were aware of problems with the, with the Vulgate, but this brought it into sharp relief. Right, so this is really the beginning of what we now call text criticism. Yes. Right, this, uh, the notion that the biblical text is not pure. Yeah. Uh, it's gone through hundreds and now thousands of years of scribal copying and error and changes, yes. and that we can accumulate evidence from, uh, from manuscripts and from codices and as many places as possible to try and understand, on the one hand, what the or original, yes. quote unquote, original yes, text absolutely. might have said, <laughs> yeah. uh, and also to understand where and how changes may have been introduced and yes. why in yes. some cases. But Erasmus is, is, is really the, the forefather of, of text yes. criticism in, the, in that sense, and also to have understood not only that the Latin had multiple versions of the new, but also that the Greek, the quote unquote original, uh, was also sort of a melange of, uh, of materials. Yes. That is, there's, there's the th there was, as, as we said, there's, there's no Vulgate, right? There are multiple Vulgates, and the same thing, it turns out, is true of the Septuagint, yes. the, the Greek Bible. Yeah. And Erasmus sort of t plays with both of those things at, at once, doesn't he? Yes. To, to put them, put, to get the best of both and yes. to, to fix yes. them against each other. Yes. I mean, his, in, in, in many ways, his inspiration is, is uh, Lorenzo Valla, uh, who's already begun this sort of work, but Erasmus takes it, in a way, to a, a new uh, level. And he's this idea of working with manuscripts, which of course emerges out of Renaissance humanist uh, culture, is extraordinarily exciting and new territory. You know, they're trying to work out which manuscript is actually prior to the other. This is, this is not uh, uh, evident. So that, you know, they're only beginning a task that would, would go on for, for centuries the, of how do you sort out what, which are the lines of influence and which texts are uh, accurate representations as you try to get back towards some sort of idea of an original. They understood that they had no autograph versions of, of the original, but so they knew that the best you could do was through textual work, get back as far as you could. 
Mm -hmm. And that Erasmus makes that principle, you know, the basis for biblical work and will inspire, you know, generations of, of scholars in the 16th century. Yeah, I mean, when we think about this sort of very detailed textual work, figuring out scribal errors and trying to figure out, oh, they dropped a word here or added a yeah. phrase there. It makes it sound very sort of technical and, you know, okay, so a word here, a word there, the order is flipped, and a lot of times it is. But, you know, as you say, when there is no autograph and there is no original and choices have to be made, those choices often can carry significant theological weight as well. And none of the people engaged in this were uh, sort of thoughtless about theology, right? No, they were all in, in, in it for the theology, right? Yeah. This was text criticism in the service of theological work. What that means is that occasionally, uh, in, in, in one particularly famous case that we're going to talk about, a decision made on the basis of manuscript text evidence can have really significant theological uh, outcomes. And the, the, the example I'm thinking of is what's known as the Johannine comma, yeah. uh, which as, an, as a Hebrew Bible scholar, I, I don't really, uh, Johannine is a word that we don't use. <laughs> I, I think it has to do with the Gospel of John, but I think you know more about it's, it than it's, I do. It's, it's from the epistle first, 1 John 5. Uh, and uh, famously, as it's associated with Erasmus, uh, there is this comma, which is not punctuation, but in fact a series of words referring explicitly to the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which were in inserted at some point into the text, uh, nobody, you know, even to this day, it's, it, it's, a, it's a continuing debate, nobody knows when it, was happened, when it happened, but it's not thought to be or, you know, original at all. Erasmus was highly skeptical of it, and his, in his 1516 uh, New Testament, uh, he removed it, which caused a storm of controversy because he had removed the biblical evidence for the Trinity. Right, the Johannine comma is, as far as I understand it, the only explicit reference to the Trinity in That's the entirety right. of the New Testament. And so this was, this was, this was enormous. The, you know, they'd done, now he restored it in 1522, and, and people debate about why he did this. Did he want to appease the ch uh, church? Did he, uh, was it a matter of conscience? All sorts of it. But it seems that he remained highly skeptical that this was the case. And the emphasis on grammar and the study of texts and the study of manuscripts is not separated from the theological resonances of it. These people do not see themselves as separate text scholars, but serving the doctrines taught by the church. And in Erasmus's case, we often see, you know, we see that he you know, uses the Greek to correct the Latin, um, but he saw himself as not undermining the Vulgate, but actually trying to restore it. Right. Trying to, and we know from you know, paintings of Erasmus that he cast himself as the figure of Jerome. He, Jerome was a great uh, model for him. Mm -hmm. He saw himself as restoring Jerome. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue of Greek, and again, f we, we all know that the New Testament was in Greek, mm -hmm. was written originally in Greek. It may not have been as, as well known perhaps uh, back then, at least not, uh, not to the lay person. But Erasmus, by putting the Greek in there, in a way, brings back to the forefront the, the notion of like, a biblical language, right? Yes. Sac a sacred language. That yes. Greek, Greek is somehow, the Latin is, is nice and it's what we use, but that the Greek has some sort of higher authority as being the original, the language of the original writing, in the same for instance of, of Hebrew in the, in the Old Testament. Yes. I mean, Hebrew in particular, because those who wrote about the history of languages in the 16th century were absolutely clear, for, for, you know, in many cases, that Hebrew was the root language and that God spoke Hebrew. And, and so, but, so it, of course, is it, it, sacred language, as is the Greek. Latin does not have that. Uh, status, although it is the language of the church. So it has a, a kind of secondary, uh, and the vernacular comes below that. Right. But how, how many people, I mean, we're talking about, in all of this, we're talking about a very elite, yes. uh, you know, very, very yes. small, thin uh, layer of society that is engaged in any of this, that is literate, that is literate in, in ancient languages, that is literate in, in any of this. Uh, how many, I mean, who, who really had the capacity to deal with Greek, and even more so Hebrew? Um, which, I, as I understand it, was an even more, even more arcane and obscure at the time. I mean, Hebrew is uh, only beginning to emerge uh, in Northern Europe in the 16th century. It's brought north of the Alps from, from Italy, but you're talking about a handful of people who are really able or proficient 
in reading the biblical text. It's, it's an extraordinarily small number. Grammars start to appear in the early 16th century, but this is, this is a long story uh, of, of Hebrew. And so there are, it's dependent on a small number of people who can make the translations. But you're right, it's, 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 it's an elite. Uh, Greek and Hebrew, the original languages, are available only to a small number of people. But those, and we'll talk about this shortly, those uh, versions will become increasingly the basis for the vernacular translations. Luther, Tyndall, uh, will you know, be drawing from these, these languages to produce you know, in both cases, the vernacular translations that will be extraordinarily influential. But Erasmus did not know Hebrew, right? No, he did not know Hebrew. It's one of, for me, always one of the most fascinating aspects of uh, this early sort of Reformation period in the, in the biblical scholars is their need to access Hebrew forced them to engage with uh, Jewish populations Absolutely. in ways that they, they were otherwise yes. not accustomed to, yes. let's say. Yes, I mean, in, in a couple of different ways. They needed uh, Jewish teachers, and that was a regular practice. They needed the rabbinic tradition to understand the text, to learn Hebrew. But, and this becomes uh, uh, extraordinarily difficult, they tried to separate that from being overly influenced by what they saw as the Jewish tradition of uh, interpreting the Bible. So they tried to make this kind of division where they were drawing from it, yet separating themselves. And often you find amongst Christian Hebraists some of the most uh, vehement anti-Jewish literature. Even, even at the same time as, I remember at one point looking with you at uh, a, a Reformation Bible with commentary and uh, starting in Genesis, and the commentary right at the beginning is pure, I mean, purely out of rabbinic texts, yes. right? They're yes. absolutely using yes. it at, and in, in, in part using it to talk against, right? The, you know, the rabbis say this, but. Yes. But the, it's simply the engagement with, which actually we don't even see today for the most part. No, uh, it, no. it was really a height in some senses of engagement with, with Jewish uh, and Hebrew thought. And they'll go out of their way to explain that this, is, this, is, this use of those texts is primarily to learn the language and to learn the history and various other things that are profitable but not what they would call the doctrine, not the teaching, because, you know, as we will get to later, with the highly Christological reading of the Old Testament, they separate themselves from that. And that's a, that's a balance that they try with you know, not a great deal of success to, to, to maintain. Yeah. Uh, so there always, there's always a great deal of apology. There's a lot of ten there's tension. Uh, and, and, and you get these accusations, um, Luther makes this, uh, of the saying that many of these Christian Hebraists are engaged in what they call Judaizing, that they're too influential, influenced by the rabbinic right. text. So one of the interesting uh, sort of ironies is Erasmus, as this major figure mm -hmm. at the beginning of the Reformation, which we think of as you know, the moment when the Bible was opened to, with vernacular translations, opened to the, the masses, mm -hmm. he's doing incredibly elite work. Yes. Um, does he see himself as doing elite work or as, as in fact contributing to something for the benefit of, of the many? And if it is for the benefit of the many, how does he think that a, putting the Greek and the Latin next to each other is going to accomplish that. I th I th you know, he talks about, uh, in the introduction to the, to the New Testament, about how his goal is that you know, the, the common people will have access to the scriptures. He does not make that step himself. He does not produce uh, vernacular translations. But he really does see this essential textual work as in the service of the church, that it will lead to translations which will put the Bible in the hands of of, of people, they have this sort of idealized uh, notion of what that would, would be, but nevertheless, that the Bible would you know, reach the wider church. But Erasmus uh, never saw himself as doing that, that work. But it, it is safe to say, as we, as we move now into, into the next session about thinking about these vernacular, the major vernacular translations, it's safe to say that they would not have been possible without Erasmus yeah. having come I first think, and, think, and, and done, laid the groundwork for it. And them. I think for, you know, for two reasons. His text, his New Testament text is, is so important. It creates a model for the work that will be done on the Old Testament. And also the inspiration that he is for you know, future, not only the people who emerge from his circle, but for future generations. He teaches them a whole method of, of translation, translation and textual work that is of the greatest importance. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about in our next session.